much for the invitation and for organizing this very nice conference. So I finally get to meet a lot of people I haven't seen since before COVID. So thanks, thanks to the organizer. So I, I decided to change the title of my talk. So sorry for people that were expecting something else. And to talk about the relevance of being irrelevant, somehow about irrelevant deformation since uh, uh, Changrim uh, and uh, Gabora have been already introducing a lot of stuff about that. So that will help me in, um, in this talk. So um, I will be um, talking about recent works that I, uh, that I did with uh, Giancarlo Camillo and Tiago Fleury, which is in the audience, and Matte Lenses, which is also in the audience and Sasha Demologikov and another work, related work with Lucia Cordova and Fidel Shaposnik. And a lot of work which is currently in progress and I hope it will get at somewhere at some point. Um, yes, sure. Is it fine like this? Okay, sorry, I have a low voice, okay. Uh, right, so um, this is a short, uh, well, this is a table of contents. I will start by introducing what I mean by relevant deformation, and in particular by PT bar, I will remind some, some of the properties and some of the features of these deformations. Um, and then I will give some motivations why I think they are interesting deformation to study, why they can tell us something interesting about QFT and about quantum gravity too. Um, and then I will shift the perspective. So here mainly I will be talking about uh, the flow equation and the Lagrangian perspective, the action perspective, if you prefer. And here I will, and well, when I talk with, about TT bar, this will be actually general for general um, 2D QFTs. Um, but when I consider the whole class of what I will define to be relevant deformations, uh, I will focus on integrable, deform on integrable quantum field theories. And the nicest setting where to study this series is actually the setting of factorized scattering, uh, where these deformations become what are called what we call CDD deformations. So I will introduce these and talk a bit about scattering picture and how we use the thermodynamic beta and Zs to study these uh, their features, which I, I'm sure everyone knows how to how does it work. And, and then I will present, um, well, the analytic properties of the ground state energy that we see in these models, the typical properties. And, uh, and I will present a numerical approach that we use to solve the thermodynamic betanzats in, in these situations. And then I will give some results for a certain type of model. So this so-called two CDD models and an elliptic cinch cordon model, which is a model that was introduced by uh, Mussardo, was proposed by Mussardo. And, um, and then, well, I mean, this is an example of something that can be done. And then I will give some conclusions and outlook. So let me start with, um, with the same thing that Changren start from. So let me consider a CFT, a fixed point in the space of theories. And let me consider the, the region in the vicinity of this, of this CFT. So I will limit the consideration uh, to the case where there is just one relevant operator. Of course, everything generalizes. Um, and then I also consider the addition of this bunch of infinite bunch of irrelevant operators. So this is the usual thing. The dimensions are given by this. And I just for simplicity, just disregard the possibility of uh, marginal operators. Now, everyone knows that here in square bracket is a UV complete theory. So it's a theory that is consistent at all scales. Nothing is bad, but as soon as I add uh, an irrelevant operator, then this usually shatters UV completeness. So the theory is, is effective. If I try to make a perturbative expansion, then this leads to accumulation of UV divergences. Everything is, uh, this is things, known stuff. So the theory is non-renormalizable. In the end, I have no predictive power. And I can say something a bit more pointed in this uh, direction. So following Wilson and Kogut, I, um, they teach us that the, the, what we should consider is the space of uh, quasi-local field theories. So it's a space and each point of the space is associated to an action, which is equipped with a length scale, which is the scale at which we probe the theory. And this action is the integral uh, restricted according to this scale of some Lagrangian density, which depends in principle on fields and all the derivative of these fields. So you can go arbitrarily high uh, in the order of derivative. 
And then the meaning of quasi locality here is that I, um, this, um, I allow for these theories to display no local features, but only in a certain range, which is epsilon, only below a certain range, which is the inverse of lambda. Um, each of these actions describes the QFT. Actually, this is not exactly precise, and I will mention in a moment, um, up to this characteristic length scale. And the RG group in this case can be seen as a flow equation. So I have a space that I can somehow, even though it's not precise, consider as a manifold. And I can consider the tangent space to this manifold. And the tangent space is given, um, the, the vectors in this tangent space are the operators of the theory associated with the action. And the RG group is a flow equation that tells us given a certain RG time, the logarithm of a length scale, how the action varies when I consider one, one flow, so one vector, uh, vector field. And the QFT truly is an integral curve of this flow equation. So it's not just a point, but it's an integral curve. So it's the, a theory which is seen as um, uh, considering different scales at which I can look at the same theory. And the properties, of course, varies with the length that we look at. Now, if we try to solve this equation and move towards larger time, then we are going towards larger, large scale properties and no problem is expected. And the, the reason is that uh, you need more degrees of freedom to describe the UV than the IR, as everyone knows. So when I go towards the IR, I am actually eliminating degrees of freedom. I have everything that I need and I don't expect any pathology. On the other hand, if I try to go backwards, I do expect the pathology for the same reason. So usually I expect that there should exist a, a length scale, a critical uh, RG time, such that at some point my theory will not belong to the space sigma anymore once the, this RG time is smaller than this, uh, this L star. And this is equivalent to saying that there exists an intrinsic UV scale, which is given by, by some mass parameter and the exponential of this, which is, for example, an example is the Landau scale in QED. Now, it so happens that for certain specific choices, this L star can be seen to be infinite. And the, space, the subspace of these uh, sigma uh, of these theories that have L star equal to infinity is the subspace of UV complete QFT. So it's a space where you can remove consistently the, the cutoff. So this is something that everyone knows, I think. And um, this is a pictorial representation of what I just said. So one can think of the CFT, I take a relevant direction and I expect to, to keep being inside sigma and also point to flow either to a CFT or I might flow to an empty theory. So it depends on the situation here. In this example is just another CFT. But if I take a generic irrelevant operator, I will just go out of the space at some point. Now TT bar and in general, these irrelevant deformation I will talk about are such that you do follow the same destiny as these irrelevant deformations, but you get to a point where you do not really get out of the space or you do, but still, even if you do, you can control what happens here up to a certain point. So the claim that I make here is that this class of irrelevant deformations give you complete control on the, on the theory, but still they, they define something that is not a proper QFT. They define some, that is not a proper Wilsonian QFT. So this is not a, U, a typical UV complete, uh, so UV completion. But still my claim is that it's something that is an extension of what we, what we consider a UV completion. And it's something that we, we should study because it holds the promise of having you know, nicer properties and in particular connections to string theory and QFT possibly. If it's, not the, if it's yeah. not the quantum field theory, what is it? Well, I mean, it's, it's not a Wilsonian quantum field theory. According uh, to so the- Is it a fine-tuned QFT? But still, for example, it does satisfy so, localities or- According to, to Wilson, uh, a QFT is a QFT that is UV complete. So is a, QF, a QFT is something like this, where you have a UV and then you flow with RG towards the IR, whatever it is the IR. But in this case, yes, you, yes. so somehow you can see this as, as going the other way. Uh, you have a prescription to follow the RG flow in the other direction somehow. You start from the IR and you try to reconstruct the UV. And what you find in this, usually this fails, of course. But if you try in this 
type of theories, you get you can get to the UV. You can study what happens in the UV. It's just very weird because it's it's not a UV complete. Uh, actually, but, uh, maybe maybe the question is that if if, if you go back uh, go up in the UV, does it to satisfy some of the actions of quantum field theory? Like, does it satisfy Whiteman actions or something like that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I uh, I I'm not sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, I mean, there there are issues with what I can say is that there are issues with locality. Mm -hmm. Locality is a big, it plays a big role in these theories, and actually the theory is expected to seem to be completely non-local, only the energy momentum tensor is the only local object that you have, but everything else seems to be non-local. This room is very much similar to what happens in gravity, which is why I think these are interesting, since you can actually control what happens to these theories, even mm -hmm. if you don't have I, these I, I features. So it's some degree of non-locality, but it's under control. Yeah, yeah. The main, the main thing, my main statement is yes, that you have control on these, and they are somehow robust ex extensions of Wilsonian QFTs, and so they are worth studying. Yeah, this is the main point. Uh, yes. Can I ask a similar question, which is, in your Landau pole example for QED, we know we can cure it if we have a unified theory that the U1 gets embedded into, right? Yeah. So now let's flow up from the bottom, and are you allowed to integrate in the massive states? for the non-abelian theory in this flow? Or are you getting non-locality because the, you're getting close to where the uh, heavy states are, but you didn't put them into the theory? Yeah, it's, uh, it's not clear. This is one aspect that we're yeah. trying to understand. So maybe it's a normal theory if you uh, might integrate in some new yeah. particles or something. Well, I mean, one thing is that if you insist of just keeping TT bar, then you, you are bound to end up here. But if you do what Changreen said, like you start with TT bar, but then add an infinite tower of things. So you keep on adding uh, stuff in your- But that's still field. adding operators with the same degrees of freedom? Huh? In the second thing, you're still, are you adding, are you changing the number of degrees of freedom or are you just you can, tuning you, up? You can also do that. It's okay. more complicated, but you can. In the example of Shangrim, it was the same degrees of freedom, but in yeah. principle, you can also add particles okay. in the system. Uh, in some way, you can try to reconstruct this flow from the bottom up just by adding this, this tower of uh, things. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, so let me quickly say what TT bar is. TT bar is defined, well, can be defined consistently at the quantum level by taking a point split procedure. So you consider this combination, which is a point split determinant, and then take the limit for X prime goes to X. Now, of course, if you're in a quantum theory, you need to take care of what happens here, but these operators, which are the energy momentum tensor component, are very nicely behaved. And what you find is that the expectation value is a constant. These are is what, uh, um, Gabor talked us about, and that the expectation value factorizes into a determinant. And importantly, the OPE tells you that if you look at the limit uh, of coinciding point, what you get is this operator that you're searching for, a contact term that you can always get rid of by just redefining the fields in your theory, and then a bunch of, of fields that they appear as derivatives. So when you take the expectation value, you just get TT bar and a contact term that you can just ignore. So everything is well defined, it's consistent. You have complete control even at the quantum level on this operator. And then what you do is you define the deformation of the action in the, in the flow equation that I showed here. Sorry, I didn't write it. You define this flow equation for your action and here you place TT bar. And what you see is that you can find uh, an equation, which is the Burgess equation. You already saw that for the finite size spectrum for any state, this works. And it also works for any expectation value of conserved charges. And here is what happens for the energy in the case where, well, for example, for the ground state where P is zero, this is a typical ground state configuration where you go to uh, minus infinity with some coefficient, which is the central charge. And, and then you have a bulk term here. Now you can decide to perturb the theory with alpha positive or negative. When alpha positive in my notation gives you this kind of situation where you have an energy that goes to a constant, which is very strange because this means that you have a finite number of degrees of freedom and you're considering a field theory, but still you get something that looks like it has a finite number of degrees of freedom. I don't have any understanding of this aside from a proposal that was made by Magog, Mezei and Berlinde 
that's holographically this theory is, is like uh, it pushes the the boundary of EDS towards the bulk, and then you have this argument that you you cannot have more degrees of freedom than a black hole in a finite volume, so you have a finite number of them. Uh, but that's just a proposal for for the moment. I didn't have. Uh, I'm not sure if it's confirmed. And uh, on the other hand, which the situation where I will concentrate on is the situation where alpha is negative. Um, in which you have the formation of a square root singularity. This square root singularity is a Hagedon uh, transition, as I will show in a moment. Uh, yep. And the way to see that is that you simply use the functional relation, which is equivalent to this part of the equation, where p is equal to zero. And then you insert the CFT behavior, and you see something like that. And now, depending on the sign of alpha, you get either this behavior, which means that the um, an entropy density is finite, or for alpha less than zero, you get this. This is a calculation that was done, for example, in Bergbon and Rabinovich when they show these relations here. And this is a typical Hagedon type energy spectrum, which is for the case of alpha less than zero. All right, so let me give you some motivations. Some of them I already gave you, but maybe, maybe some more some more motivations. There are many practical reasons. The first of all, first, well, they allow a high degree of control and they are interesting per se, so it's worth studying them for this reason. And they preserve existing symmetries. This is another important uh, feature, uh, which is shared by TT bar and all the other deformations that I will show. So integrability is preserved along this flow. You can keep on studying these integrable theories as integrable theories. TT bar itself is universal, almost any, action will do. You can start from almost any theory. The other ones that I will show, no, they require the existence of additional charges. And, um, and this is the debated uh, thing that we mentioned yesterday. They sort of span the subspace of integrable theories with some caveat. And there are important motivations. So you get this non-Wilsonian EV behavior, which is especially the fact that you see this non-locality is interesting because it's uh, um, the usual lore is that once you have no locality, everything is lost, but actually probably something can be studied here. I mean, for sure something can be understood and the role of non-locality and understanding the role of non-locality, I think it's particularly important. Um, it has robust features, so it's completely controllable. It seems to be a sensible extension of QFT, so this is already seen. And um, another thing which I will quickly mention is that these irrelevant operators that appear later. Uh, they control the subleading correction to critical behavior. This is a nice application that I, I haven't studied in, in depth, but I might in the future because I found it interesting. Um, if you consider, for example, the scaling limit of a lattice system, think of like easing for Ising model, for example. If you tune the, parameter, the parameters appropriately, you end up in a CFT, of course, in the continuum description. And the first order the correction to the CFT are given by relevant operators. Think about the energy, uh, the energy operator in ionizing CFT. But the subleading corrections are controlled by irrelevant operators. So in general, you will have something that looks like this, where this term here, this is the free energy and this is the, the mass of the system. This term here is, the, is controlled by, these two terms are controlled by the relevant direction, but these are controlled by irrelevant contribution. So in the case where you have a theory where TT bar is the first irrelevant operator, or the irrelevant operator with lowest dimension, then you can use the properties of TT bar to constrain these quantities that appear here. In particular, you, found the, you find this relation. And here in these articles, they, they speak about this uh, contribution of irrelevant operators in, in lattice systems. All right. And then there are loads of important applications. This is just uh, a partial list. Um, uh, so just like this. Okay, are there any questions? Can I go on? All right. So let me move to CDD deformations. Now, irrelevant deformations as uh, this of the same type that have been uh, introduced by Changrim and uh, by Gabor, they can be cast into um, the S matrix, a deformation of the S matrix. This is an example of the deformation that you have when you deform your theory with TT bar. 
it can be shown in various ways, it was shown in various ways. Um, and it reduces when you have a factorized scattering to this, uh, um, to this form here. Since theta is the rapidity, m is the mass of the particle. Uh, you can have m, a, and b in the case where you have more than a year. I'm concentrating on a situation where you just have one particle, which, because it's simpler, but it's extended to, to any number of particles. These factors here are called exponential CDDs, and they automatically satisfy as processing and electricity, macrocausality, and so on. Note that these can be taken as a definition of the TT bar deformation, and this is important because I will, I will extend this definition, as was done by, by Chang, Grimman, and Gabor. Um, and it is possible to recover the action flow via using the TBA, for example. Note that when I have um, alpha less than zero, this is an healthy theory, but probably has no local observable. Uh, but when alpha is bigger than zero, you have superluminal propagation. Alpha bigger than zero is the case where you have a finite degrees of freedom um, in the UV. So this is just an observation. Um, now, I want to extend this definition defining a family of S matrix, uh, S matrices, starting from a, from a seed one. And I multiply this as matrix by a factor of phi. The factor of phi is divided into rational and exponential part. The exponential part is an entire function. So this doesn't introduce any pole. It just changes the asymptotic behavior of my S matrix. And on the other hand, I can introduce any number of poles that I want. And this will still be like a cochere S matrix as long as I don't introduce additional poles in the physical strip. And that's because the poles in the physical strip correspond to bound state. And then I will have to go through the trouble of doing the bootstrap and you know, enlarging the space, uh, the dimension of my S matrix. But I will restrict to the case where these poles are in the unphysical strip and they correspond to resonances. So particles of complex mass using bright Wigner. So this is the thing that I will study and I will specialize to certain examples. Now, once you have the S matrix, uh, you can access to the TBA, as everyone knows, you just, this again is the single particle. This is the, the focus in this talk will be on single particle, but in principle, everything can be done for N particles. And this is the fermionic TBA. So this is the case where your S matrix goes to minus one when T is equal to zero. And uh, you can recover the ground state energy of the system with this equation. And in particular, the, what we study is the effective central charge. When R goes to infinity, the effective central charge goes to zero. Um, and when R goes to zero, you get this, you know, this very famous relation. You get the central charge of the UV. Uh, and if, the, um, if your action is, uh, sorry, if your UV theory is not unitary, you get the contribution coming from the dimension of the operator of the lowest lying operator. Now the exponential CDDs, uh, once you insert them here, they form the driving term. So for example, TT bar, this because you get a, an additional contribution to the S matrix, which comes from the exponent, and then you can bring it back inside the driving term. For TT bar, this is cinch, so you get this relation here, which is exactly co coincide with the, with the functional form of the Burgers equation. Um, but now for Russian CDDs, you, you cannot do that. So there are no exact results. You need to do numerics. And now the problem is that uh, once you insert these, um, these Russian CDDs, you see these um, uh, square root singularity forming. And so when you want to, to try and solve this uh, TBA, you run into problem because the TBA is unstable. Once you get close to this square root behavior, your, TBA, your numerical procedure just crashes. It doesn't work. The usual iterative one. You can also see uh, the fact that you have uh, more than one branch arising when you study the R-infinity analysis for you do a, an asymptotic analysis at infinity. And you see that you don't only have this behavior, but you can have different behaviors. So you have a situation where R, this should be, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, this is small R. Small R is M times R is small R. So either your pseudo energy grows, but it can also go to zero when R goes to infinity or it can become negative, but only in a certain portion of the rapidity line. Now this situation you can prove it's only possible in the TT bar case, but this situation here is, uh, is quite common and it's possible if this quantity is bigger than one. Now this quantity that I define here, this is um, a bit misleading, it's not the L1 norm, but you know, 
uh, sort of, it's just a notation. Uh, this quantity measured the difference between bound states and resonances. And this you can see simply because phi is the logarithmic derivative of S. Um, so what this tells you is that once you have uh, um, more resonances than bound states, yeah, this is minus bound uh, the difference between, it's the difference between resonances and bound states. So if you have more resonances than bound states, what happens is that this uh, inequality is satisfied. And so you have two possible asymptotic behavior at infinity, which means that you have two branches of your solution. And so you, you expect to find a excluded singularity. And this aspect is confirmed by, by the fact that you see numerical instability when R is sufficiently small. So you need a, a procedure to handle this singularity. And the procedure is actually extremely simple. It's, uh, it's a procedure that is used in dynamical systems a lot. And it's called the pseudo length continuation method. It's very simple. It simply tells you instead of, of trying to search epsilon as a function of R, you try to search epsilon and r as a function of an auxiliary parameter. So you have a curve that is not, that is not too valued anymore. And you simply implement these uh, in a recursive way. So you can do it how you want. You can do like Newton method to solve the equations that you get. There are various ways. Uh, but this is the core idea, uh, which is really simple. And this allows you to, and it's also very efficient actually. And it allows you to, to follow this curve all the way, starting from large r, going around the singularity here and going on the second branch. Now, what we saw in all the, the models that we studied is that the behavior is universal. So when, if you take it completely randomly in the space of all possible factorizable matrix, you pick one, you will find a behavior like this. This is the behavior that you see. The anomaly, the anomaly in this case is the situation where you actually have a, a UV, a complete UV, because these are isolated points. You need to have very specific conditions in order to have that, that uh, behavior. Um, all right, so what we will consider now is just a theory where you have two resonances. So it's um, in a matrix of these kinds. And you can study various ranges of U1 and U2. But the most interesting is when you send U2 to be pi over two plus I infinity. Now, if you do that, then this becomes one. And what you get is a bosonic version of a one resonance matrix. So it's essentially a bosonic version of Sinch Gordon uh, somehow, or well, actually of the staircase model. No, yeah, depending on u. So if u is between minus pi and zero, this is a bosonic counterpart of Sinch Gordon. Otherwise, if it has a, um, an imaginary part, it's a bosonic counterpart of the staircase model that was shown uh, before. Um, now, both these theories um, display a branch point at some value of r. So they effectively correspond to two resonances model. What I mean by bosonic is this, is that the S matrix has the same form, but when you go to the TBA, instead of having a plus here and a minus here, you get a minus here and a plus here. This is the bosonic statistic for TBA. Bosonic statistic has always been problematic. And the reason is, is essentially because of this is because when you have a bosonic statistic is like having an additional resonances a resonance into your into your particle spectrum now we witness is the same qualitative behavior so this is uh, yeah well these are just some analytic that, mm, analytic computations that you can do on the second branch you can try to study the behavior of the energy like the linear you, what an interesting thing that you find is that you have a linear behavior which is this so you have this linear behavior and then the correction is not one over r but it's one over r, r cube the one over r term just disappear um, we couldn't get very much far inside in these uh, these computations because you would need to solve this equation. I have no idea at all how to solve it. And so this sort of stops you from, from doing some nice analytic analysis, but you can do numerics without any problem. And that's what we did. Um, so this is an example. You see that the pseudo energy becomes negative in a certain region of the theta, theta line. 
So this is a new feature that it's allowed by the TBA. It's perfectly perfectly okay, aside from the fact that the energy is is uh, too valued. Uh, this is an example of the Y function, and um, yeah. Okay, there is nothing that much interesting. One interesting thing is that if you try to take these two CVB deformation here, this um, S matrix here, and you and you take this limit where gamma is equal, uh, gamma is a parameter, then you have a, a shift of theta zero and you send gamma to pi over two, then the TBA reduces to this uh, um, Y system, this sort of Y system. Which seems to be interesting. Uh, we haven't studied it thoroughly. It's something that we plan to do, but it's just an observation. All right, and the other model that I want to show you, how much time? Yeah, I have some time. Okay. Is um, uh, the, um, uh, sorry, elliptic Sinch Gordon model. This is a model that was uh, proposed by um, by Giuseppe as, um, as an infinite resonance model. So having elliptic functions here means that you have an infinite number of resonances, the crosses, um, the dots are the poles, so they lie here, the crosses are the, are the zeros of this S matrix. And we simply decided to study this, uh, this model. Supposing that what we said before is true, that if you have more resonances than particles, then your system is had shows this instability, this square root, then we should see the same thing. And in fact, we did, but we did something more. We managed to get past the square root and to study the complex solution to the TBA equation. So this is the usual, uh, this is C effective instead of being the energy, that's why it's positive. Um, you see the square root, but then you can go past that and you see that, of course, the solution becomes complex, but when you tend to R equals zero, it, it becomes free. It actually goes to zero, see effectively. Um, now, what I think is that it would be interesting to find a way to understand what's happening here. When you when your solution when your TBA solution go complex, so what what is it saying? Is are we really going towards some kind of UB here, even though it's a complex? Can we make sense somehow in this context of that? This is one of the questions that I would like to to address. Yeah. So the yeah. So this curve, for example, take the purple one. This is the physical branch somehow the one that goes to zero at infinity, then you have this Hagedorn uh, transition, this per root, and the other branch is a linear branch that goes to infinity like this. Now, if you push your, uh, your TBA to go past the, the square root, then your solution becomes complex. And you see, this is the real part, and this is the, the imaginary part. Ah, yeah, sorry, maybe. Yeah, it wasn't written, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the continuous line is the real part and the dotted line is the imaginary. Okay. Now in the Argos infinity limit, uh, you see that the effective central charge seems to go to zero and you can actually reproduce that with the logarithm trick, even though I mean, you're not guaranteed that it should, it should work. But essentially this is um, a, an expression for the limits for R that goes to zero of the effective central charge for one particle uh, TBA. Y zero is just the exponential of epsilon zero where epsilon zero solves, the, solves this equation. <coughs> Now, in, this, in, the, in the case of the elliptic inch quadrant model, you can see you actually have a num an infinite number of, um, of resonances. So you need to study the limit of this equation for phi one that goes to infinity. And if you look at the solutions, you have, of course, an infinite number of solutions, and the solution condensed on the unit circle in this way. And in order to agree with the numerics, you need to choose the um, the solution that minimizes C0. So essentially are these, black, these field dot solutions here. And if you do, then you reproduce exactly the, the Argos zero limit. Um, yeah, you can also play some games. For example, you can try to study the non-unitary minimal models like this and try to add a bosonic uh, uh, statistic. So you study essentially this model with bosonic statistics. And what you see is that since they have more than one particle and you're adding essentially one resonance by doing this, this uh, bosonic statistic, they are finite 
they have uh, a real R goes to zero limit. And we saw these numbers. So they don't appear to be rational. I, I don't really have an interpretation of that, but they seem to be consistent models. Um, so in principle, you can, when you have more than one particle, you can always try to, bos to consider the bosonic statistic, even though you don't know exactly the model that it corresponds to, but it's a well-defined model. Um, all right. So concluding, um, we began exploring the space of this generalized city bar deformation. Now, this is one probably long term uh, program, but it's something that I am sure will tell us something about this, um, this non Wilsonian UV behavior that you see. So, more understanding of these theories, I think it's, uh, it's needed. Um, now, the scattering perspective makes contact with the S-matrix bootstrap. So that's another interesting, interesting uh, application that we are in some, somehow we are exploring the space of consistence of factorizable S-matrices. And moreover, we saw that the majority of them, they don't seem to arise for, from a UV complete theory. You get the, the, the overwhelming majority is not UV complete, not in the usual sense at least. And, um, we found this uh, condition on the space. Now, this is an interesting thing. So we found this condition. Uh, we only, this is an observation that we saw that if we have more resonances than particles, then our system has this Hagadon singularity and whatever. And by, by itself, if, it's, if it is generalizable, it looks like something that can be extended also beyond integrability because it's something that has to do with the particle spectrum of the theory. Now, trying to understand if this is actually true, past integrability, I, I think it's, it will be an interesting task to follow. Um, and interestingly, we introduced an improved numerical technique uh, to deal with singularities in PDA. By the way, this can also be applied to, uh, for example, to the analytic continuation of Dori and Tateo. When you want to go to excited states, you do an analytic continuation of your TBA. And this uh, numerical technique is actually very efficient in doing that. So this is something that can be useful in other contexts too. Um, there are things to look at, of course. Um, one thing, and this is, um, I'm sort of throwing my heart far, but uh, maybe what we see in, when we go in the complex solution of the TBA might have to do with the existence of complex CFTs. This, what, this is something that was proposed by uh, Gordenko and, and some of his collaborators. Uh, they are not very well known, this complex CFT, so it's, it's a bit hard to understand if, it's, if this statement makes sense or not. But it might be the case that if we go and look for these things, we might find them in the UV of, in what can be the UV of this series. Um, yeah, so what else? One interesting thing will be to go and consider models with bound states. I, we only studied models with one particle, so it would be good to go and study a bound state. And especially in considering this, um, this point that I mentioned, it will be interesting to look at sine Gordon. Sine Gordon has a spectrum that uh, where the number of particles depends on the coupling. So if you study sine Gordon and try to deform introducing resonances, then maybe tuning the coupling, you can see the appearance and disappearance of this uh, of the Hagedon of the square root singularity, and this can give indication into this um, this uh, statement that I made here. Um, yeah, one other thing, like looking at the formation of the unitary minimal model, the bosonic statistic, and, and all for this. And one other thing that we're looking at is the fact that uh, when um, when you have this um, square root singularity, you have a, a state that has lower energy than the ground state. So the question is, is the ground state stable or is it unstable? And if it is unstable against what kind of decay, what are its product? This is a kind of hard question because it requires you to go and look at the loop or the first loop order in the action. And if you want to be general, that's very, very complicated. And, and it's something that we're looking at with, uh, with Alexander Zamolochikov at the moment. And, but sadly, I don't have anything more to say about that. So I hope next time. I will. And that's all. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Uh
Yeah, since you mentioned it, uh, what are these uh, uh, what are these complex CFT? Can you remind remind me what's the proposal? Yeah, so the the proposal of um, of Gorbenko is uh, that so you have CFTs um, where you can have uh, operators with complex dimension, but as long as you have complex dimension and complex conjugate dimension, then they still define that as being a real CFT. What they consider by complex CFT is a CFT where you do not have the complex conjugate counterpart of a complex dimension operator. Then in that case, it, the, the theory is truly complex because you don't have a complex structure that you can use to map your theory around. And, uh, and they have, they come in pair, of course, because you can conjugate the whole theory. And, and they have very peculiar properties that they just began studying. So not, almost nothing is known about that. Like one interesting thing would be to go and try to do CPT on those, but that's a very advanced uh, thing to try and do. First one should have control on the theory themselves. So at the moment it's something for the far future. But Thanks. Uh, oh, can I have a question? Yeah. So would you show me the about two slides before about your central charges there? Yeah. yeah. So wh how... What's the case here that you, you introduced still two CDD factors? Yeah, no, 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 no. This case is, uh, this one is, mm. uh, uh, sorry, is n equal, for example, this number here is n equal to, so it's m two uh, two four yes, seven. Yes, yes, yes. M two seven. But when I put a minus one in front of the S matrix. Ah, ah, just a sign change. Yeah, yeah, it's just, so these, these numbers here just appear from a sign change in front of this S matrix. It is the simplest possible, Resonance. Right. If so before changing the sign, this S matrix is well known as a as a Taiwan three D formation yeah, exactly. of this non unitary yeah, conformity theory. Yeah, 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 yeah. These are the non unitary. Yeah, that's models. right. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. We just so, took the S matrices and put a minus sign in front of them and so, just try. So this is not related to T T bar. Then, right? No, it's not. Okay. No, um, I mean. You can, con in the same way that you construct mm -hmm. your uh, results, you, you can construct these uh, from. Right. Actually, we consider that this, for example, yang -Ni case, when yes. n equal one. Yeah. Then, um, if we apply this massless uh, scattering yes. theory, then uh, we found that central charge of UV should be three fifths. Three fifths. Rather than two fifths. Two fifths is yang -Ni Yes. Because we are talking about C effective. Yeah, the yeah, C yeah. effective yang -Ni is. A, yeah, 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 yeah. Because you need to subtract yeah, two over five. dimensions, of course. So, and then we found that there is, a, there are actually Two or three central charge, UV central charge. Yeah, One of them I is three know. over five. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it has a rational central charge in, in UV, mm -hmm. but the difference is that we introduce a CDD factor in yeah. addition to those S metrics. Okay. But since you just change the sign, it's the same thing. It works in the same way because it changes the, the, um, the integral of the kernel on the theta line, you add one to that. If you put a minus sign and you change the statistic in the TBA, then it's like adding a, a delta function. But where is the alpha dependence? Because you, since you are, you are interpreting this as a deformation of TT bar, right? Oh, well, no, I am. Uh, so the deformations that I'm considering in general are of this kind. Where, where, where are they? These ones. So they are CDD deformations. Right. So they there can be... contain TT bar in here, but I just put this to one. I just uh -huh. don't consider ah. that. And I consider this kind of deformation. So the same one that you consider. But there's a theta J that they are related to, to some deformation parameter? Or? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, in principle, you can take one of these factor and expand it in exponential. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you will have a relation between theta J and these coefficients. But, but our choice was to divide these inside and in, uh, into an entire function so that that's, you know, that, that doesn't have any poles mm -hmm. and something that instead has explicitly the presence of poles in this way. But yes, you can. And then you can say, oh, this is this superposition of uh, TT bar. TT, yeah, TT right. bar in that case, uh, you know, the, the S matrix should depend on those parameters. But yeah. since your S matrix doesn't have it, because just the minus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a limit. So it's a limit where theta j goes to, where is it? It was somewhere here. Yeah, it's this limit. Ah, here. some constant. Limit where u goes to pi over 2 plus i infinity. So it's a special limit. Ah, so it's a here. still kind of special limit of this 2 CDD. Yeah. Model. That's why you don't have parameters. You send it to a specific oh. point, yes. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I'm not sure you know, there is a paper of mine, yeah. 2000. Okay. The title is Bosonic Type S Matrix, yes. Vacuum Instability and CDDs Ambiguities. Okay. So it's exactly concerned with square root singularity, the okay. present CDD irrelevance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you know this paper or. I, 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 no, okay. No, I don't. I, I will read it. I'm sorry. It, if I didn't... Because I think it's the first paper yeah. that addressed the question, who are the CDD factor? You know, in the s yeah. theory, there has been always this mystery that you get a putative S-matrix, mm -hmm. you get the right spectrum, let's say, yeah. and you can check it. But then, since uh, Dalits uh, and mm -hmm. uh, people uh, relate to CDD, mm -hmm. uh, they say you can always alter this by this factor to satisfy sure. unitarity and cross. So there was always the mystery. Yeah. So the first paper that really addressed directly the question, what are the CDD factors, is this paper I'm mentioning. Okay. And then where was find out that is related to irrelevance, because relevance cannot change the spectrum. Okay. So. And moreover, sometimes, depending on the sign, you might have vacuum instability, yeah. which is like a BCS theory, when yeah. you start to condensate things and then blow up the, the vacuum. Mm. Okay. So it's a paper of 2000. Okay, thank Nuclear you. Nuclear physics B. Thank you. I will, I will have a look at it. And I'm, I'm sorry if I, it just skipped me, uh, my radar. I didn't get to it. Thank you. Any other questions? So do you have any, like, is it possible to find unitary examples with uh, irrational central charges, or that's a peculiarity of the non-unitary case? Uh, you, you showed these. No, uh, I, think, I think it's possible. I mean, like, if you consider Liouville, uh, uh -huh. Liouville can, you can put the central charge to you be whatever get, you want. Uh, I mean, ones that arise naturally through some TT bar flow or? Well, I mean, no, well, this depends on what you look, uh, on what you find. This is actually one question. I'm just because, asking about unitary analogs yeah. of what you have here. Yeah, because your question is related to these, right? We cannot be completely sure that we actually get the central charge because of, if it's not, uni non you don't really know from the start if it's non-unitary or not. Uh -huh. So yeah, it's a bit tricky. That's that's one of the things that I was mentioning before. If we manage to actually, you can actually do it in CPT. For example, if you now I don't have a, a, a proper picture, but yeah. Anyway, um, if you study the solution of the TBA and you go to R equals zero, then you can identify this analytically. But then you can study numerically uh, when you subtract the leading behavior how the energy approaches. Uh, and then the exponent tells you uh, the, the deforming operator. So from that, you can intuit which is the uh, CFT that you just by CPT, you study the CFT. Yeah, and yeah. Then you study so in that. principle, you can get a in lot of information, you can. but you need yeah, extremely one, good numerics to, yeah. to get a lot of information out yeah, or, from, an, or another technique. Yeah, well, I mean, no, as far as I know, no technique, no analytic technique is known to extract, um, is known. Yeah. Uh, so I, I I don't know of any way to accept. that would be extremely interesting because yeah. it gives you access to to uh, correlation to sorry OP coefficients and but I, as far as I know there is no way to do that. Thanks. Any other question? Uh, yeah. If you I think it's the slide where you have these irrational central charges. Yeah. I just had a, a question. So um, I think you, you wrote in there uh, that these theories have a spectrum of particles with some masses and one added resonance. But uh, you were just saying that the only thing you've done is to change the sign of the S metrics. Yeah, that's because the sign works more or less like a resonance. It's, but I mean, the, pole, the position of the yeah. poles is not changed by putting a minus in front, right? No, 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 no. But what you do is you take one of these factor yeah. and then you send the position of U2, say, to, uh, oh, to this right. position. So you... This gives you a minus. 
Now, mm -hmm. this, this, of course, is a limiting procedure. But if you think about how you pass from fermionic TBA to bosonic TBA mm -hmm. and vice versa, is you extract the delta function. Uh -huh. So that delta function is, is one of these CDD, is the limit of one of these CDD factors. Okay. And that works more or less like a resonance, at least at the level you know, of these uh, numbers that we find, it really contributes to this, um, uh, to this, where is it? Um, to, this, to this quantity with a plus one. Uh -huh. So it's, it's like it adds the resonance. Okay. okay in, this sen in this sense, it's, uh, it's mm -hmm. one resonance in some way. Are we done? Uh, okay, let's thank okay. uh, the speaker again. Yeah.